I hope to answer a question about my trajectory and how is it that, that the same writer could get from the image on the left <laughs> <laughs> to the image on the right. That's Alex Gray's uh, memorable painting <laughs> of the, the stoned ape theory of the, how psilocybin led to human con self-consciousness. The path that the, of someone's career really only appears as a path in retrospect. This is something we construct after the fact. Uh, I really didn't know where I was going. Um, the path of a writer is not like the path of a doctor or a lawyer. Um, it's, it's really crooked. Um, and uh, so this appears um, something you figure out after the fact, um, which only goes to show that you don't know on this journey which books you'll be grateful to have packed or where your curiosity will take you. Um, and that was another, this is another um, writing lesson I learned around, uh, along the way, which is that questions are more important than answers, um, and that a good question can drive a book from beginning to end in a way that answers don't always. Um, that questions lead to more propulsive writing, more sus suspenseful writing. Uh, it becomes, indeed, the difference between a speech and a detective story. So the, the question in this book was what I think of as the bumblebee question. And that was, it occurred to me, you saw me planting those, those weird looking, that was, uh, I was planting potatoes. And one day I was planting potatoes in my garden and it was a beautiful day, you know, May in, in Northwest Connecticut. And while I was planting potatoes, the bees were just avidly going after this apple tree that was in spectacular bloom. And I, you know, gardening doesn't take up that much mental space. It's one of the things I like about it. And um, it occurred to me, um, I wonder what I have in common with those bees. Um, you know, look what they're doing. They think they're getting the best of this arrangement with the, with the blossoms, that they're getting the nectar. Um, but in fact, they're being manipulated by those flowers to pay a visit in order to advance the interests of the, uh, of the plant. So who's in charge? Are the bees in charge? Are the plant in charge? And it was, um, and, and I thought, well, is that happening to me too? I'm planting this kind of potato, not that kind of potato. I've ordered these seeds. They've been shipped across the country. So are these plants in some sense, these domesticated plants, manipulating us? And that question kind of launched that book. Um, and that we too are in this co-evolutionary relationship, one where we think we're in charge, but in fact, very often, we're being manipulated. Um, we are not the only subject in nature. We think of everything else as an object, but many other species are acting on us. That nature is really this dance of desire. Um, and, and so I looked at human desire as a fact of natural history, shaping evolution just like the climate does, or the soil, or the preferences of pollinators. I looked at four cases, apple for the desire of sweetness, tulips and beauty, uh, potatoes, control, um, and cannabis, intoxication. Uh, and I try to use each of these plants as mirrors in which we could learn things about ourselves, because in the same way you can look at a flower and know precisely what a bee or another pollinator regards as beautiful or aromatic, you can look at the plants that have evolved with us and understand a lot about us. And that was the basic uh, conceit of the book. So among the desires I looked at at Botany of Desire, uh, and I'm returning to in this current project, um, was this very curious universal human desire to change consciousness. Um, the existence of which has been a very good thing indeed if you are cannabis sativa or um, uh, opium somniferum or a fungus like psilocybe cubensis. Um, one of the things plants do to animals for their own purposes is drug them. Uh, it was recently discovered that the nectar of many plants contains caffeine. Why? to make the pollinators better at their jobs, make them work harder, just as it does for us. Um, so, and there are many examples like that of, of plants drugging animals to get, th get things out of them. Um, so the evolutionary success of these plants depends on that desire of us, our abiding desire to change the texture of consciousness. So you sort of see you know, you see that my real interest, I mean, food is a, is a very important interest, but I'm also very interested in this engagement with nature that, that, that happens, you know, on our plates and, and in our homes. And it, it's always happening. It's happening right now with the microbes in your gut. And, um, 
and, and bringing this to light was, has always been what I, I, I'm interested in doing as a writer. And this issue of um, altered states of consciousness, it's another thing that plants do for us or mushrooms do for us. And why? What's in it for them? What's in it for us? Um, and what turned me on to this as a subject that it was time to do it was news of a remarkable trial that took place at Johns Hopkins um, and was published in the Journal of Psychopharmacology with this decidedly idiosyncratic title. Psilocybin can occasion mystical type experiences having substantial and sustained personal meaning and spiritual significance. Doesn't sound like a pharmacology magazine. Um, and what they discovered was that a high dose of psilocybin could be, could be used to safely and reliably occasion a mystical experience, which of course the psychologists have defined and have their 10 point, seven point um, scale. Um, that the participants rank these experiences as among the most meaningful in their lives, comparable to the birth of a child or the death of a parent. That was striking. Um, and the volunteers who had the most complete mystical experience by the scale showed significant and lasting increases in their well-being and their openness to experience. And openness is one of the five uh, criteria of personality that, that psychologists measure. Um, and this quality of openness is a predictor of tolerance, aesthetics, creativity. And this effect lasted for months. Um, now, I have never had a mystical experience. I may, in fact, be spiritually retarded. Um, but suddenly, I was extremely curious about the fact that a mushroom could have such an impact on one's, not only one's personality, but one's metaphysics. Because a lot of these people were not religious to begin with. So what does that have to do with nature or food? Well, you've probably guessed. Um, the chemical responsible for these amazing effects in our brains is produced by a mushroom. Um, how did that happen? Um, uh, and it's kind of a food. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Aztecs called the magic mushroom Tio Nanacatal, the food of the gods. But it's more of a sacramental food than a, a, a staple. Still, something from nature that ingested changes us. So what does it do for the mushroom? Well, the curious thing about it is that the chemical, the psilocybin or the psilocin, um, is not found in the mycelium, the underground part, which is the central part of a mushroom, the part that, that's the organism. The fruiting body, the mushroom, uh, is the only part that has it. And that's the part that the mushroom doesn't mind having eaten but, uh, and doesn't defend. Um, so it has something to do with animals who apparently like psilocybin too. Um, and in our own time, it's been spread around the world by the human interest in these drugs. Um, and um, uh, so anyway, I'm looking at the natural history of it. Um, and I'm looking at, um, and I was very surprised to learn that if you go back pre-1965, um, that there was a, a, a kind of a golden age of research into both psilocybin and um, uh, LSD, and a lot of it, of course, took place here. But what happened here with Timothy Leary was the end of this process. He kind of screwed it up, and um, for reasons that make some sense, but before he, his antics, um, the, uh, uh, there had been 1,000 peer-reviewed studies of LSD in the literature and 40,000 research subjects going back to 1950, and very uh, suggestive results. Um, that it could be useful for people who are dying and, and addicts and obsessives and depressives. And all this research is now coming back. The government has, has eased up and allow, is allowing scientists to study it. Um, and my guess is this scientific renaissance is going to teach us some extraordinary things about consciousness and the mind, about spirituality and religion, about creativity, and about this handful of mental disorders it's being used to treat. Um, the most interesting in the first was giving psilocybin to people who have terminal cancer diagnoses. Um, and this study was done at NYU and Hopkins. And I spent a lot of time interviewing the people uh, who had this experience. And it was fascinating. But I want to end by reading one passage uh, about one character uh, who I actually never got to meet, because he died before I had a chance. Um, but his name was Patrick Metis. One of the most compelling stories I heard was from a volunteer in the psilocybin cancer trial I never got to meet. He died before I knew his name. However, I did get to know him slightly through the words of his wife and therapist and the remarkable pages of his journal. Everybody is asked to keep a journal of their experience. 
Patrick Metis was a New York journalist diagnosed with the cancer of the bile ducts that had spread to his lungs. As it happens, Patrick was almost exactly my age and had first read about the psilocybin trials in the same New York Times article I did. Though he had never before taken a psychedelic, he immediately called NYU to volunteer in their psilocybin trials. The experience he had there would change his life and his death. I first heard Patrick's story from Tony Bosis, one of the investigators in the psilocybin trial at NYU. Tony, a bearded, bearish psychologist in his mid-50s, had been so deeply moved by his work with Patrick that he obtained permission from his wife, Lisa, to share his story with me. Um, I need to share with you just a bit of it now, since Patrick's experience of learning how to die, what Socrates said is the most important work we have to do, is one of the reasons I decided to embark on my own psychedelic journey of research. Um, <laughs> In the course of four or five hours spent laying on a couch in a treatment room at NYU, wearing eye shades and listening through headphones to a specially curated playlist, Patrick underwent a journey by turns wrenching and ecstatic. In his journal, he likened the start of that journey to the launch of a space shuttle. That's me hunting for psilocybin mushrooms. But this is what I want to show you. This is the setup in the, in the treatment room. Um, and that's the therapist, the guide and that's the volunteer, and that's the spiritual tchotchkes they put all around. Um, in his journal, he likened the start of that journey to the launch of a space shuttle, a physically, this is his words, a physically violent and rather clunky liftoff, which eventually gave way to the blissful um, serenity of weightlessness. Early on, he re-experienced the trauma of his birth, but as both mother and child, Tony's session notes say Patrick drew his knees up to his chest, convulsed, and when it was over, began to cry softly, saying twice, birth and death is a lot of work. Birth and death is a lot of work. And then, oh God, it all makes sense now. So simple, so beautiful. Metis also took an internal tour of his body. I went into my lungs and saw two spots. They were no big deal, Metis recalled. I was being told without words, not to worry about the cancer. It's minor in the scheme of things, simply an imperfection of your humanity. Then he experienced what he described as a brief death. I approached what appeared to be a very sharp, pointed piece of stainless steel. It had a razor blade quality to it. I continued up the apex of this shiny metal object, and as I arrived, I had a choice to look or not look over the edge and into the infinite abyss, the vastness of the universe, the eye of everything, of nothing. I was hesitant, but not frightened. I wanted to go all in, but felt that if I did, I would possibly leave my body permanently, death from this life. But it was not a difficult decision. I knew there was much more for me here. Telling his guide about the decision, he explained that he was not ready to jump off and leave Lisa, his wife. When Lisa came to pick him up after the session, Patrick looked as though he'd run a marathon, but also radiant. He told her he had touched the face of God. Patrick lived for 17 months after his psychedelic journey, and Lisa reports he was a changed man, able to enjoy the time remaining to him free from the debilitating fear and anxiety that had plagued him before. The siege of his terror had been lifted somehow. We still had our arguments, Lisa recalls, but Patrick had a sense of patience he had never had before. And with me, he had real joy about things, she said. It was as if he had been relieved of the duty of caring about the details of life. Now it was all about being with people, enjoying his sandwich and the walk on the promenade. It was as if we lived a lifetime in a year. Metis spent his good days walking around the city. They lived in Brooklyn. He would walk everywhere, try every restaurant for lunch, and tell me about all these great places he discovered. But his good days got fewer and fewer. In March 2012, he decided to stop chemo. He didn't want to die, she said, but I think he just decided that this was not how he wanted to live. In April, his lungs failing, Metis wound up back in the hospital. He gathered everyone together, this is his wife's words, and said goodbye and explained that this is how he wanted to die. He had a very conscious death. Metis's equanimity in the face of death exerted a powerful influence on everyone around him, Lisa said, and his room in the palliative care unit at Mount Sinai became a center of gravity in the hospital. Everyone, she said, the nurses and the doctors, wanted to hang out in our room. They just didn't want to leave. When Tony Bosis visited Metis the week before he died, he was struck by Metis's serenity. 
Patrick was consoling me. He said his biggest sadness was leaving his wife, but he was not afraid. It is very strange to feel something akin to envy for someone dying of cancer. But hearing Patrick's story, I realized this man had acquired that essential knowledge so few of us ever will, which is how to die with equanimity without fear. Somehow I didn't completely understand the mystical experience he had in that room at NYU, courtesy of a molecule produced by a mushroom, had showed him how to die. Thank you very much. Thank you.